Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent. I'm the producer of the Join Us in France Travel Podcast. You're listening to Cider Chat. And this is episode 183. Hello and welcome to Cider Chat. My name is Aria Wincoller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. This week is a collaboration with Annie Sargent and her Join Us in France travel podcast. We're going to be talking about Normandy Cider Trail tips, and it's a really exciting opportunity for me to collaborate with someone whose podcast has helped me guide my way into France more than once. More on that coming up. But first, a bit of news out and about in Ciderville. Welcome back to all the regular listeners of Cider Chat. And if you're new to this here podcast, well, we got a humdinger of a chat this week for you. Uh, if you've been to Normandy, France, uh, if you've thought about going to Normandy, France, if you're, you don't know about cider but you want to learn, or if you're a total cider geek like I am, This episode is going to make you thirsty, so get ready for that. (laughs) And what's going to be a little bit unique about this particular episode is we're going to go right into the featured conversation with Annie. She's releasing the same same, uh, chat on her podcast, Join Us in France Travel Podcast, because it seemed to make sense for two podcasters who do something, especially her. She's very focused on France. I'm an avid listener of her podcast. I always recommend episodes of her podcast specific to people who are going to to travel to France, who are going to land in Paris, everything from going out to Mont Saint-Michel or seeing uh, Paris from an insider's view. Annie and Elise, who she sometimes co-hosts with, they're a lot of fun, and it's a really informative podcast, so check it out. Uh, it's one of the the shows that I do subscribe to and love to recommend. So it was so delightful for me to be able to collaborate with Annie and to do a dual recording and for me to release my piece to all of you out there in Ciderville. So we're going to go straight to that chat and get an insider's tip on Normandy. And then at the end of this here uh, feature chat with Annie. I'm going to be announcing the winner of that Twitter contest to get that copy of Susanna Forbes' new book, The Cider Insider, A Hundred Craft Ciders to Drink Now. So stay tuned for that. That'll be coming up at the end of this conversation. But in the meanwhile, let's head straight to this chat because there's so much to talk about with Annie and to provide those of you who normally listen to this podcast, maybe a little bit more tips that you didn't know about and uh, to see a flip side of me being interviewed a little bit and uh, collaborating with another podcaster. So away we go. Get your glasses ready and your cup so very full because we're out and about in Ciderville this week with Annie Sargent of Join Us in France Travel Podcast. Welcome to join us in France. Bonjour, Annie. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. So this episode is a little bit, is very different from anything I've done before because we are both going to release the same episode where we talk about cider in Normandy. Well, that's fine by me because I can't get enough cider in Normandy. So having two more podcasts (laughs) is perfect. How come? why, Why the cider? Why? Uh, cider, I've been involved in cider in the U.S. Uh, for 25 years, uh, primarily because of the region that I'm in, in Massachusetts, is where the cider focus in the U.S. and really its impact worldwide was felt. Uh, I'm part of Franklin County Cider Days, and I began teaching cider making 25 years ago. And that passion has continued forward. 
And so many years later, I realized, you know, I have a bit of info. People are kind of hot on the cider trail. Why don't I start sharing my knowledge, my connections, and now, like you as a podcaster of welcoming people to France, I went to cider. You know, cider is interesting to me because I know a lot of people want to do wine touring in France. But, of course, in Normandy, there is no wine, right? I mean, you you haven't run into any wine up there, have you? Uh, no, n- not really. Of course, I'm not really looking for wine. And that region is just renowned, just like Bordeaux is really renowned for grapes. Normandy and Brittany are renowned for their apples specific for cider and their pears specific for cider make, making, too. Um now on your podcast, uh, I, I know you, I've really referred to your podcast quite a bit for the folks who are going to France. And uh, I was wondering, could you share a little bit how you got into podcasting and what was your incentive there? Well, you know, it was really um, the, when, when my father passed away, I found myself with a lot of time on my hands and I was pretty depressed and decided I needed to do something constructive with my time. And I had been a podcast listener for a long time, since the very beginning of podcasts. And so I decided, well, why not do a podcast? And then I thought, well, but what am I going to talk about? And my good friend Elise was a tour guide. And so I thought, oh, if I can talk her into doing kind of tour tourism things about France it would be awesome and I talked her into it <laughs> and so for the first uh, maybe 60 70 episodes it was just me and her all the time and then she decided that it was an awful lot of work and that uh uh, maybe I should find some, you know, produce some other episodes with other people, which I have since been doing. But it, for me, I have, you know, I'm French born and raised. And so uh, I left France when I was 21 and I didn't come back. I didn't move back to France until I was almost 40. And so I I feel like I'm rediscovering my own country. I uh, I'm from the southwest of France. I know the area of the southwest quite well. But the rest of France, you know, I have memories from my parents taking me to these places. But I hadn't really visited very much because I, uh, those, those your, your listeners who live away from home, you probably know that. Uh, When you live away from home and you visit home, well, you're always visiting family and that's all you ever get to do because you don't have eight weeks of vacation in the year, right? Mm -hmm. And so I ended up coming back to France every year when I was living in the U.S., but I didn't hardly see any of the rest of France. And so when we moved back to France with my American husband and uh, French-American daughter, uh, I decided I got a see my own country. And so I started doing that. And the podcast was an excellent excuse for me to go see all these wonderful places in France that I didn't really know yet. Right. I mean, France is such a wonderful country because each region has so much diversity, so much specific products for that region and sites to see. It's almost like the podcast just could go on forever because there's so much that you share. Probably. And you do share quite a bit. Well, Yes, yes. And what I like to do is to have uh, conversations with people. It's not a produced show at all. I don't, you know, I, I just talk with people and I ask them how their visit went and what they liked and what they didn't like and what they recommend and that sort of thing. And it's very fun because some of the time I have been to these places and sometimes I haven't. But I'm just like... The, my listeners, I want to find out. I'm curious. <laughs> you know, that's that's how it works for me anyway. Well, shall we talk a little bit about cider then? And I could share with you a little part of France that I've been able to discover. And it sounds like you haven't really been in Normandy, at least in the search. Yeah, some. But I mean, I've been to the big, you know, I've been to Bayeux. I've been to Caen. I've been to uh, Mont Saint-Michel, obviously. A few times, but uh, Lisieux, for instance, I've never been. It's I was just reading up about it. 
and the Honfleur, I've never been. I know it's gorgeous and that everybody raves about it. But I, and I can see the photos. It does look gorgeous. Actually, one of the photos I use as the, uh, as the header for uh, joinusinfrance.com is, is Honfleur. <laughs> so, you know, it's gorgeous. I need to go, but... It's kind of far away because I live in Toulouse, you know. So for me to drive all the way to uh, Normandy, like to those areas, it would probably take me a good 10-hour drive. And I think a lot of uh, Parisians will go out to Enfleur. At least it's known that way uh, because it's about two, two and a half hour drive, maybe a little bit more probably uh, depending upon traffic. And for Lisieux, right, people could take a train to Lisieux, although if you're going to be doing any kind of traveling about in Normandy, you really need to have your own car. Uh, you, you know, it's you not, do. Yeah, you can't do it any other way. Yeah, uh, this is something I've pointed out in all the episodes about Normandy is this is not a place where you can use public transportation. I, f- I did an episode about how people can go to the Mont Saint-Michel in, on a day trip uh, from Paris, but it's really not uh, as a day trip, it's a bad idea. But you can go to the Mont Saint-Michel by train. I suggest you stay overnight. But <laughs> When I, I'm traveling, and I'm sure you probably agree, I try to minimize the amount of travel time and to take a pace so you can really take in the exquisite countryside of Normandy and, and of all of France. And That's right. And, and driving in France is really not that difficult uh, once you understand a few basics. And I've done several episodes about driving in France. There's a whole category on my website uh, where I've discussed driving in France with different people. And I used to teach driving in France, too, (laughs) years ago. This is before I left for the U.S. And so um, I have a good idea of, you know, what Americans find a little uh, startling about driving in France. But driving in Normandy, honestly, it's pretty easy. It is easy. Uh, The only kind of catch is if you are tasting cider, that brings in a different factor into driving. (laughs) So Yeah, you need a driver. uh, Yeah, uh, that's why I lead tours to Normandy so that people could just be, well, totally into cider and not even have to think about that driving part. Um, That's right. They can just enjoy it. So tell us a little bit about, so you mentioned that this area is famous for growing the pears and the apples for the cider, right? Correct. So there's specific apple varieties, just like you have grapes that you eat and grapes for making wine. The same is true with um, cider apples that you wouldn't necessarily want to be munching down on them because they have bittersweet and bitter sharp profiles to it that are excellent for bringing out tannins into the cider and the same is true for the pears there's eating pears and fermenting pears and that has right that has right to, and it's the same with wine right and it has to do with, with the grapes soil. correct yeah yeah exactly so that's why everybody there is making cider and um they're distilling it into calvados and calvados is a uh it's it's at that same level as cognac, but cognac has really you know taken the swing. You see a lot of cognac in the U.S., but you don't see too much Calvados. You really want to go to Normandy to hunt down the the Calvados, and that's part of the fun to uh, explore, and <laughs> discover. Yeah. So you actually, uh, where, where do you take your your tour? I mean, your your visitors when you drive them around Normandy on your side or route. Where do you take them? Well, we typically meet in Paris first, um, again, because I always try to like slow down that time, and then we leave from Paris and return to Paris, and that seems to make quite a bit of sense. So when we we arrive in Normandy, we're like ready to go and start sipping and walking about the orchards. So our first destination that we did last year, we went out to the Route du uh, Cidre. You know, a cider in France is spelled differently. It's C-I-D-R-E. And so we we head out to Route du du, uh, Cidre, and that is about 40 kilometers. So it's it's not a, a huge area, but the truth is cider is all around Normandy. That's just one one particular area and it's 
It's very well marked. Right, so they've designated that area as Route du Cidron, but you find cider everywhere in Normandy. That's right, and it's uh, made by farmers, and then there's different kind of levels of uh, producers making that. Yeah, this is a funny story, and I think I might have shared it before on the podcast, but years and years and years ago, I was on a um, summer camp, and they sent, my parents chose a summer camp in Normandy, and this camp, uh, well, actually, I think technically we were in Brittany because we were much further west than Lisieux and all of that. But I don't even remember because I was only like 10 or something. And this side of this camp was a cycling camp. And I had this little friend and I, we weren't very sporty and we weren't very fast. And so we were always, we would always drag behind the rest of the group and uh, we ran out of water, so we uh, walked into one of these little farmhouses and asked for water. And the lady was so nice to us, she actually sat us down at her, in her kitchen and she gave us a glass of cider and some cookies. And then she filled up our water. <laughs> and I thought, oh, these people are wonderful. I want some more of that. So the next the next farm, what do we do? I throw out my water and we go, oh, we ran out of water. <laughs> and same thing. They gave us a glass of cider and a cookie. <laughs> and uh, yeah, by the end of the afternoon, we were somewhat, you know, buzzed. <laughs> That's my memory of cider, but they weren't giving us the hard cider because in, in Normandy, they do cider for kids and cider for grown-ups, right? Yes, and um, the cider for kids would not be fermented, so it would have no alcohol in it, but it sounds like you were getting... Oh, it has some. Oh. Uh, oh, it has some. Well, yeah, yeah, Le Cidre Doux in France has like 2% alcohol, and the, uh, Le Cidre Brut has like 5 or 6% alcohol. At least that's what I'm used to. You're, you, yes, you're correct. And I, I'm kind of taking like the more American approach that um, the children would, would just be given the the fresh-pressed apple juice, which is at all the no, cedaries yeah. versus the cedar doux. Yeah, that's not what they were giving us. Yeah. They were giving us the cidre doux, which <laughs> tastes sweet and has a little bit of alcohol. So if you drink enough of it, like we were, yeah. <laughs> you, just, you definitely get a buzz, yeah. especially if you're 10. And, and that's what's lovely about that is uh, typically the, the French are drinking cedar a, as a kind of accompaniment to crepes. Uh, not like in the rest of the world or in the U.S. specifically. We have it for dinner. We have it for lunch. Um, so, yeah. You know, it's uh, kind of interesting that way. Yeah, you do. You order a, 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 a piche de cidre with your, with your crepe. Yeah, that's totally what we do. I don't, I don't drink cider very frequently, but if I go to a creperie, that's what I order. Yes. And it's changing. Uh, even in France, which has such a deep tradition into cider and the way it's made, and there's the Appalachian control for that region, it is starting to change, and there's, you're, you're seeing the classic... French Normandy farmhouse style cider, the, the the ones that you mentioned, but also now it's going more towards at, uh, some of the producers at least are making it more as a wine style um, of cider that's a bit more drier and doesn't have that kind of farm farmy funk to it, which I love. I I mm. the first thing I land in France and I have to have a classic. 750 mil bottle of that Normandy cedar du or cedar bouche, you know, just oh, it's, but it is changing. Yeah, it's it's very good. Mm. There, I even saw a place uh, in uh, uh, there's a place. I think we were in the Basque country. I can't remember for sure, but we were in this restaurant with a big choir group. So it was we had booked the entire restaurant, and what they they had a big old barrel, and they had a waiter who would cork the barrel but then if you approached with your glass you would uncork it and you had to you, you had to aim your glass to pick up the cider yes <laughs> and after by the end of dinner nobody could aim right it was ridiculous you know because 
we kept drinking that stuff like it was water. It was terrible. <laughs> they have a cider festival every single night in that regional world. Uh, they make cider differently there. Uh, really informed, really, the rest of the world. Uh, for Normandy, most of the makers that I know there, they credit uh, Asturias and the Basque region for cider. And then it kind of came up the coast, ah. went over to England, and, you know, kind of the apples just started rolling out of Kazakhstan and went around the world. I didn't know that. See? I mean, I experienced it, but I didn't know the reason behind it. You know, I just, yeah. like, you're in a group. Everybody's having cider. Okay, give me some, <laughs> you know. Well, I think you hit upon the, uh, the, the one thing that I love about cider and that it is fun. It's fun. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because it's not so strong that you're going to be, you know, drunk quickly. Like, I mean, yeah. most of us can have a, a fairly big portion of cider without being tipsy. With wine, eh, and definitely with Calvados, you'll, I would be under the table in five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good point because uh, with cider, it's typically in, in France, it's half if you have a full glass of cider, it's half the amount of uh, alcohol percentage as a glass of wine. So a glass of wine anywhere in the world is around 11 to 13 percent. And for cider, yeah. uh, Americans are making it 8.5 percent. But in France, you're cl classically seeing around 6 percent uh, yeah. as being the highest that you would see. And when it has that level of alcohol in France, usually it's not very sweet. I mean, it's not super dry either. Like, but you mentioned that maybe they're starting to make it more dry. But yes, uh, yeah, the ones I've had is yeah. You'll find you'll find different uh, things going on there, and we're even seeing some makers in France taking a little bit of lead from the Americans and adding what you might call an adjunct to the cider. Uh, one is hops. Believe it or not, because the oh. apple is so inviting to so many different profiles and spices. I mean, Americans put coffee into cider, put in oh, wow. hibiscus flowers, uh, you know, peppercorns. I mean, the sky is the limit with cider, whereas with wine or even beer, there's kind of a, it's been going fast in the world, but cider has just exploded in the best way possible onto people's and consumers' line of sight because it's so inviting for so many profiles you're not seeing that too much in france it's such a traditional country in that way and that's the beauty of it but at the same time they're opening the door and saying oh what's the rest of the world doing and, and that's just the way of the world isn't it that's good yeah that's good that shows that they want to keep up i mean if people are starting to flavor their cider with hibiscus flowers why not try it yeah, right. Why not? Exactly. I'm not sure everybody yeah. would agree, but, you know, I, I, I'm of that same mind. Why not go for it, explore it? But but my main yeah. goal is to really go and to taste specific cider varieties. Like one type of cider might be made with just one or two apples varieties. And that's the beauty of it. Mm. And, and Pédoge has their... They even they have an apple called Calvados, believe it or not. That was okay. Yes, yes, yes. Brought up, you know. Uh, I guess it was on a ship coming up from Spain, and it went off the coast, and they, you know, salvaged it and got the apple off of that that ship. If I'm remembering that story correctly, and now that's used uh, specifically for making Calvados. So not all apples are even used to make cider. They'll make cider first, and then they'll distill it to make Calvados. It's so fascinating. Oh, I see. I see. Mm -hmm. So it's the same, so they crush it some more for the Calvados or something? Uh, well, the way they make Calvados is this, they begin with the, the cider. And again, they're going to just use specific apple varieties. Uh, if they, then they'll um, just allow it to ferment and then they'll distill it. But they're just looking for a very specific apples for that Calvados blend. So when they make cider, okay, this is this is me being an ignoramus, but when I, I have made apple juice in, in the past, and the way you I made it was um, it was like a 
funky contraption that would have water on the bottom that heated up the apples but didn't penetrate anywhere near the apples. And then the apples would start boiling and there was a um, spigot where the apple juice would come out of. Is that pretty much how they make apple juice to make cider later? No, it's not. Um, okay. I, I do know okay. that, that contraption that you're talking about. Um, for cider, oh, across the board, there is no heat. Uh, okay, so it's a crushing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, have you ever okay. seen, when you're in Normandy, these big, round, um, it was called a degage, I believe, and it's a round circle. Can you spell that? Uh, I think it's uh, D apostrophe G U A G E. Before modern technology came in, they'd throw the apples in this circle, and a big wheel would go around, around often pulled by a horse or a donkey or mule, I guess, and crush the apples. And then they take those apples and put it into a press. A lot of time, the press back then, uh, they were using uh, a combination of different straws that they'd wrap up the cider in and then press it in this big, giant wooden press. You still see those uh, beautiful, round, circular, uh, apple-crushing circles at the Musée de Poire and, and different cideries, and they'll put flowers in it. Uh, they'll only use it now for really, like, demonstration, like historical demonstrations. But uh, that's part <laughs> of the history of it, you know? you got to start somewhere. Interesting. Yeah. How do you crush an apple, yeah. you know? <laughs> you need some... Uh, a, a whole bunch of apples, too, to make juice. Yeah, you do need a lot. <clears throat> yeah. And so, they, so let's talk about the towns that you hit on this tour. Yeah. On the tour that I do, we, we have gone to Lisieux because that's very close to the Route du uh, Cidre. But a lot of folks listening to join us in France and who have heard, you know, about cheeses, they'll know um, the cheese Camembert. But there is yeah. a town that is m- kind of spelled like Camembert, but it's Cambremer. It's C A M B R E M E R. And that's right in the heart of the Route du Cidre. And in that area, there's just a whole flurry of cideries. And these are producers who are very used to doing tours. And they'll have an oh. tasting room. And uh, you could set up a tour, you could do a tasting, and they'll have cider products uh, um, such as, you know, the cider uh, bouche. And then they'll have pamo, which is a blend of uh, cider and calvados, and then they'll also sell calvados. And so, like, one... Uh, you, s- you mentioned cidre boucher. Yes. So what is that? Is that like a cider that's not from a barrel, but... But in a bottle? It's in a bottle, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in a bottle. And okay. A lot of, um, uh, I could get really technical, and I don't want to kind of overwhelm listeners, so it's almost like you got to go to Normandy to kind of know all the different ways that they make <laughs> cider there. But they, they will use the champagne method for making cider. Uh, and, huh? and that's really a trademark name for the French. But that's bottle conditioning. To, to create the bubbles. So for winemaking, you make your initial you know, wine from the grapes, and they store the bottles upside down during that initial fermentation. So they make the wine, they put it in a bottle, and it's stored upside down, and there's sediment in that bottle that they'll do what's called riddling. They'll turn the bottle, you know, a little turn, and then all, that plug will go to the top of the bottle, They'll freeze that end. They'll take the the cork out. There's just enough pressure because there's been some, you know, residual sweetness in that bottle to continue fermenting. They'll throw out that plug. They'll put a cork in and let it bottle condition. And then you'll get these exquisite small little bubbles in a bottle conditioned bottle of cider or, or, you know, that champagne method. Yeah, you'll get that in Cidre Boucher, but you might see some people who are force carbonating, and then you're going to have a, a larger bubble. That's the difference between bottle condition and um, forced carbonation. The bubbles are really of a different size. The champagne bubbles are oh. really t- uh, very small and delicate, and it, it, it throws off right, a right. bouquet. So there's You're right. There is a lot to this. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I just, you know, I just see it. I see all these names, but I don't really know how it's. And sorry, I keep interrupting your flow there. You were telling us about Lisieux and Camabreur and Cabremer and all that, but sorry. No. Okay, now I know. Cidre Boucher is just a type of bubbly, more kind of gentle bubbly cider. Yeah, yeah. It's it's using a traditional method in, in uh, Pédoge. Um, yeah, it's just a cider. Well, okay. It's just like a cider under a cork. And Yeah, Boucher just means this is a cork. Yeah, yeah. And and it's just a delightful cider. I mean, you just you know get a bottle of that. You have some uh, wonderful French bread and uh, some nice soft cheeses, and you can go out into the orchard and just take in Normandy, just really breathe it in. Uh, I'd like mm-hmm. to, I'd like to recommend to um, both our listeners a, a great great times to go to Normandy. I, I would recommend to really experience the uh, apples and pears is blossom season, which just ended, I believe, in Normandy. Uh, It was like last week or so happening. And that's a wonderful time to just see the countryside. I mean, let's face it, May is beautiful, isn't it? I like leading uh, my cider tours in the fall. So I have a Mm. tour set up for the last week of September. And I've been going the last week of September to Normandy because I always find, and you know, knock on wood, it's always sunny, and the best part is the apples and pears are on the trees. So you could actually taste that apple or pear, even the ones that you're not going to fully munch down on. You could get a little bit of the taste, and then when you're drinking the product that's made from it, the cider that's made from it, it really brings you deeper into the bottle. And that's an absolute joy because there's some varieties that are growing in Normandy and Brittany that you don't see anywhere in the world and they should only be grown in that region because they work so well with that soil yeah so I, I'd recommend for folks you know who want to explore who want to drive their own car and go out you know head out to the Route du Cider I would I would recommend two different regions of Normandy go out to that Route du Cider and and Make some stops along the way. Uh, do a little bit of research. You know what they want to do to kind of stay in that area. I haven't stayed right in uh, the town of uh, Cam. Am, am I? Sa- can you help me with the pronunciation of that town? The how would you say that in French? Cambremer. 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 We. Oui. So that that is an exquisite little town. Uh, there's, you know little cheese museums to experience. You could go to Pierre Hout. That's a, a cidery there. They've been, they're open their tasting room. And right behind that um, cidery, Pierre Hout, is a beautiful garden. Um, and he, the, uh, it's, it's open to the public. It, it costs very minimal. It's just right up the hill behind Pierre Hout, the cidery. Right in that town, you're right there. There's places to get uh, food. You can find um, Airbnbs, uh, you know, nice bed and breakfasts. That's a nice region. Uh, also, very close. How many, how, how big is the town of Cambromer? Um, population, I, I, I don't know specifically. It, for me, going in, it's just a quaint little town. It's not like Lizou. Lizou is much larger. They have large hotels there and uh, yeah. it's kind of bustling. But Cambrame is <laughs> a, a very quaint and small. Um, mm-hmm. Right in that region, you know, you have some very fine producers. Another producer I'd recommend is Domaine Dupont. That's spelled D U P O N T. And mm-hmm. the interesting story about that domain is that the great-great-grandfather was able to buy that estate by selling Calvados. So, you know, Calvados <laughs> was a commodity, and that's how that family was able to acquire Domaine DuPont way back when. And now, so many years oh. later, they're world-renowned. They have a wonderful tasting room um, and fantastic Calvados, and they are pretty innovative uh, with their cider. I've had Jerome Dupont, 
who unfortunately left us too early at the age of 48 last August of 2018. Uh, but he, oh. he traveled the world, you know, and was a real major force behind innovation for cider. But his father is still there, and uh, Etienne Dupont, and that's an exquisite cider. He highly recommend it. It's probably the one that people in the cider realm in the U.S. always want to go to Domaine Dupont, and there's a good reason for that. Huh. Yeah, and they don't, I mean, I don't, I don't purchase a lot of cider, but I don't remember ever seeing that brand. So they probably have a fairly small production, I would guess. Well, they're exporting a lot worldwide. Some of these, oh, and, and that's true for a lot of um, producers, you might just be able to find their product at their tasting room. And you might be lucky enough to see the, the farmer if they're not out milking the cows. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the way it is. You kind of have to wait. And, and that, that's the fun of it. If you have time traveling in Normandy, uh, if you're doing a tour, as you all know, uh, you, you know you're going to meet the maker. They're going to have that time set aside. They're going to really be talking sure. to people and, and um, leading you around, which you can't be guaranteed when you're just traveling solo. But, you know, there, there's, that's a benefit of traveling solo, too, is to be on your own, no doubt. Uh, another cidery I'd like yeah. to, to mention there is Pierre Jules, and that's uh, P-E-R-E, capital J-U-L-E-S. And that's like a father and son team. Uh, they've, they've been around for quite a long time, and they have a lovely tasting room, very nice product. They export quite a bit to the U.S., so any Americans listening will have seen their product but there's nothing like, you know, going to the location and drinking where the, the product was made, whether that's cheese or bread, you know, or cider or wine. Going right. there, it just tastes so different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's better at the source. Y- yes, right at the source. So I, I like that region. There's a lot, uh, you, you could, f- there's the route to cider is really well marked on the roadway, it's easy to follow. Uh, you know, 40 kilometers, you could just spend two days lazily going about. I like to go a little... Also, there's plenty of stops. Yes, plenty of stops. um, Okay. And and producers to find. So you'd want to stay somewhere close by. And Lizou is really nice because it's a, a larger town. You have more options, perhaps, for hotels. And it's it's... Close enough where you know it's a very minimal drive to, to, to find cideries. I mean, there's cideries really close by. That so that's a nice town. There's a large you know if you want to be visiting churches, there's a large church there. I mean, like a kind of like cathedral. Uh, nice restaurants to go to, but it it wasn't a, a super attractive town for me. So <coughs> this year. Uh, on the cider tour, we're going to, instead of staying at Lijou, we're going to Honfleur. Uh, just because it's yeah. so absolutely beautiful and it, it gives you almost like a, a medieval harbor town sense. It's very romantic. There's cobblestone. There's like an old section and you're right on the water. And the, I mean, the yeah. reason why you have it on the cover of Join Us uh, in France podcast because... <laughs> It's beautiful. It's very scenic. It's extremely scenic, yeah. And, and, yeah. It's, and it's a good stepping off point for uh, sightseeing. But uh, allow me to just share with you one of my favorite cider makers, and she happens to be a woman, uh, uh, one of the few women, I should say, who are making cider and very successfully is Agathe Lettier. And she's just outside of Enfleur, probably... Uh, you just drive along the water there, and, and she's in the town of Pendapi, and her cidery is called Manoir de April. Fantastic. She's actually the vice president for the uh, Appalachian and Control in Normandy for all, mm. all the Calvados. So she's highly regarded. She's, she speaks English, and I love her cidery. She welcomes a lot of tours. But as you're driving up to her orchard, you're seeing in the orchard these giant pictures of cows, 
uh, that, you know, it would kind of seem like, what the heck? That's kind of silly, maybe even kind of commercially, but she does it so eloquently. It really has that, like, feminine touch that invites you <laughs> to drive into the orchard, up into the tasting room. Um, we always do her Norman Buffet, which she does for Cider Tours. It's a classic Norman Buffet, a really simple food of a, uh, cheeses and salads and some meat, all, like, fresh and farm a really healthy meal with her cider which is fantastic that that is a great yeah because i mean if you tell me norman buffet i'm expecting mussels and fries and crepes this is more like a so this is very different kind of a like a farm you know farm farm Uh uh, experience and it is unique and that's why i always go see her on the tour she's so funny and and so inviting and super knowledgeable, so she's not pretentious by any means. You know, what's interesting, there, there are some stores. Like, finding cider, other than going to the producers, can be a little bit difficult in Normandy, which might surprise visitors coming from the States because we're used to going to any package store or liquor store and finding a whole selection of craft uh, beverages. But in, in Normandy, at least, you'll find wine but you have to really seek out the cider. and you, 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 So you could go to Manoir d'Aprelle, you could do that. And there is a store in Enfleur that has French products, so you'll see uh, cider there. But another, mm-hmm. another tip for listeners is that, and I love this, the National Parks gift stores in France, the National Forest Parks, like in Carouge, which is in, in Normandy, there's the Castle Carouge, which is lovely, Mm -hmm. has a visitor center. And in that visitor center, they have Norman products and they have a whole bevy of cider products and poire right there. Who would think? (laughs) Uh, Enfleur is kind of like, in that region, now if you go north, you won't find too much cider, but you'll find just enough kind of sparkle here and there. And um, actually on the tour I'm doing... In the fall, we're going to go up to the White Cliffs of, uh, and I'm going to make a mistake pronoun- of my pronunciation, but I call it Etrat, but uh, I know you just did a podcast. You mean Etretat. Yes. Etretat. Etretat, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, just because it's so fantastic. So it's not too far from Enfleur. So that could be a nice okay. you know, station for people to stop. And the other thing I like about Enfleur, if by chance you're happening to travel with kids, Right in the harbor there, uh, you could walk to a Ferris wheel. And they have like, I, don't, I, I believe it's there, you know, all summer long. So mm-hmm. that could be a place for both adults. And if you have some kids, yeah. it could be a, a nice destination. Although I would recommend any parents traveling with children to really uh, not build up your kids until you know. <laughs> it's definitely going to be there, you know, that the Ferris wheel is going to be there. And uh, that's kind of a nice addition to Enfleur. For me, that, that is like a, just to kind of think of, of if you had like four days, that's about all I would do without overtaxing myself. And certainly if you are driving yourself, that is a lot of, of, of cider to be tasting. Uh, so maybe have a little. Yeah. So how many, how many cideries would you stop at? Like in a day? Uh, for me, uh, on a, in a day, I, I would probably only do like three cideries at the top if I'm driving alone. Um, when yeah. I'm, I'm leading a tour, we might do uh, only three, two, only because we're just there and we're getting such an insider's view. We're even able to drink more and not worry about it. And then we have like a refrigerator on the motor coach and we're drinking more. But that's the beauty of, of French ciders is you could drink a lot, but because of low alcohol, you're not getting tipsy. So you could do a little bit more than the average beer, but you know, that's really individual choice and you want to be really careful on the roadway. No doubt about that. Um, yeah. The, you know, the nice thing of, of cider and this region is you're, you're doing the cider, but there's so much sightseeing. And, and of course, we know that this is the 75th anniversary year for D-Day uh, that's taking place. So it's kind of a busy time, certainly coming up uh, in June, like June 6th. Um, they're 
there's all you'll start seeing and if you're not used to seeing it it might catch you by surprise but you're going to start seeing uh bunkers and concrete um things that were built by the the nazis you know to uh, Mm -hmm. take over that site and it's really it's overwhelming if you haven't seen that before and then slowly your eyes will adjust and you'll start seeing more of it along the coast and uh it's, it's, it's really a very powerful experience um, yeah, they had fortifies. They had fortifications all along the coast there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that that region of Normandy is called Pédoge, and I I can't help but want to mention to the listeners that just the southern part of Normandy is um, a, a different region, and although they make cider, they're renowned for their poire, which is made with pears, and their trees there are. Some of them are over 300 years old, which is just oh, wow. insane. So I really recommend to go down to Donfront, um, to go, you know, you just drive south from Enfleur. You could go through Conk as, as you've been there. That, that is, it's kind of, you know, it's a big city. But um, just south of that is the, the well, it's kind of like a, a very large town. They might consider it a city, but that's the called Donfront, and that's now you're in the heart of the pear country, and it is a majestic landscape. And unlike Pédoge, where you've, you've, there's producers who are a little bit more businesslike, the producers in Donfront, they're farmers uh, by and large. They're kind of a small group of people, and they make Calvados a little bit different. It's made with a base of uh, poire versus up in Pédoge, it's made with cider. And most people in the world have no idea about this region. And it is, if you've never tasted poré, it's a little bit more delicate than uh, cider. It has a different tannic structure. And these pears that grow there grow nowhere else in the world. And frankly, it's like my destination to always go to that region. And there is a Route du Poré, too. Uh, there's a Musée du Poré. Uh, actually, my group that I took there last year, we were the first Americans to ever do a tour there. So it's not really oh, wow. been explored. It's just a fantastic region, uh, uh, a really friendly area. And they're, they're different. They're different kind of farmers who are pear farmers versus the cider farmers. Right, because poire just means it's like cidre but made with the pears. Yeah. Poire is a pear in French. So it's, yeah, why not? You can make yeah. similar products with the pears as you do it with the apple. That's right. That's right. And and so there's a, a, a little bit of sightseeing, too, that's really worthwhile. You know, the Musée de Poire, Donfront is, you know, a big town. There, there is Airbnbs to stay at. could go up to... Um, to the town of, uh, and this is a very big tourist town. It's uh, Bagnos de Lore. Uh, that's, uh, 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 let's see. Bagnol de Lorne? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Bagnol de Lorne. Bag- <laughs> <Thank Oof>. <laughs> <laughs> you, ha- you have me in hot sweats, man. I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> but you had it. <laughs> That, yeah, I need to give you some tutoring for French pronunciation. You need that. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. You know, it's it's hard. I've been in different countries, and I'm supposed to learn Dutch, and then, you know, now I'm trying to learn French, and yeah, yeah, yeah. But oh, I can't help you with Dutch at all. <laughs> and that town is known as uh, you, you might see a lot of senior citizens because there's hot uh, hot tub, not hot tubs, but hot springs there. But, People go there for, for health regions, and uh, that's a nice destination to get a hotel and, and to, there's even a casino, so if you want that kind of stuff. Oh, that kind of place. Okay. We, we have those in the Pyrenees as well, yeah. where there's a little casino for gambling, and there's the hot springs and the thermal baths and the hotels and the things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, there's just so much in this region, you know, and, and cider now is starting to go in full swing. They're, they're noticing what's going on in the rest of the world. I think the French have been kind of insular, but now they're reaching out. And what's really great about going there is by people visiting, you might actually help save an orchard or a 300-year-old pear tree because 
these farmers, like a lot of farmers, don't necessarily get to pass on their farm to the next generation because their kids are going off to other places. They don't see cider as sexy yet. And hopefully that will change yeah. and people come back and preserve this landscape, which is so unique for France. Oh, it's very, it's very true. You know, uh, cider in France has this uh, quaint kind of image. Uh, you eat cider, you drink cider when you go to Normandy and Brittany and and the Basque Country, and yeah, it's it's for festive activities, but it's not something we buy. I think I do have a bottle of cider in my wine fridge, so you know. But you have fifty bottles of wine and one of cider, and you don't really. Uh, we don't consume that much of it, which is too bad because it is very pleasant. It really is. I think that's going to change. And now there's actually a, a restaurant in Paris called Palms, P-O-M-Z-E. They were just awarded a Michelin bib, and it's a total cider-centric restaurant. It's actually the la oh. last night of our tour in Paris. When we return to Paris in, uh, in September, we're going to have our final cider dinner at Palms. And so you you wouldn't have seen that a couple of years ago in Paris, a cider-centric restaurant like that. Yeah. That's true. So tell us the dates of your, your, your upcoming uh, cider tour and where people can go read about it and book it. Uh, yeah, thank you for asking. That, uh, that tour is going out the last week of September. Sorry, the 22nd to the 28th okay. of September. And uh, okay. it starts and ends in Paris. And they could just go to the Totally Cider page at ciderchat.com. And they'll find a secure link for reservations and more details. And they could always contact me directly for any info. This is something that, uh, you know, I have... This is not something I would ever uh, have thought to do. <laughs> Honestly, it's like really original. It's it's really it's taking people to parts of France that are not super popular, that are not super famous, except for Honfleur, obviously. That one is like yes, very popular. But but the other ones, no. You all, all the places you've mentioned are you know low key, very very French, like yeah. very very French. Uh, so that's wonderful that you take people to these places. I, I really, uh, I think it's exciting. Uh, look, I really appreciate uh, your time, what you do with the podcast. I really recommend for folks to subscribe. Join us in France. It, it's wonderful. All the tips that you do from landing at the airport, how to um, manage that, getting into Paris, uh, the sights to see, even Notre Dame, even though that, you know, we've, lost and saw the fire there's still so much to be gained and what you bring out yeah. in your stories is fantastic i really appreciate your work well thank you thank you i uh, we like to, i like to keep it real my whole purpose was to rediscover my own country but also there's so much just marginally relevant information about travel to france there are a lot of blogs where people just tell you, as you know, because you're a podcaster and you have a, you have a blog, the best way to rank in Google is to repeat the same stuff that already ranks, right? You just do it better, a little bit better, and then you get to the first page. The problem with that is everybody keeps repeating the same information. And some of that is just what people want to hear, but it's not like, it's not the best <laughs> advice. And I am very passionate about telling people you know, French people never do it this way. And there's a reason for that. It's because we prefer to do it this other way. And I think it's valuable for people to hear that because they they just keep doing the same trips with the same itineraries. So that's why I, I'm so glad you do this. It's, it's totally different. It's great. It's awesome. <laughs> Au revoir. Thank you so much. Au revoir. A big tip of the glass to Annie Sargent of Join Us in France Travel Podcast.
I find just so much delight in that country, uh, something that really kind of took me by surprise. So how awesome is it to be able to share a bit more of my love and perhaps a share to those of you who do write into me and asking me questions, and I get a lot of this too, uh, kind of filling that out. Uh, telling you how to travel into Normandy if that is where the wind is taking you. And if you want to not do a heck of a lot of work, but just have a hell of a lot of fun, then do sign up today for the Totally Cider Tour going to Normandy, France, the last week of September. And those dates are the 22nd to the 28th. As I told Annie, we begin and end in Paris, and it is pretty much going to fill every part of your heart's desire for that region of the world. In fact, looking at her website, it appears that the two areas that people are often kind of checking out her podcast about or maybe asking her questions about are Paris and Normandy. And of course, I am not surprised. Pretty cool stuff there. If going on a stress-free vacation holiday to Normandy is something that interests you, where you don't have to worry about driving, you don't have to think about what hotel should we go into? Is that a good one? Is that going to really meet our needs? Are we going to have to like walk, 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 walk until we're super tired at night and then try to figure out where do we do reservations for our, our restaurant that evening? Uh, how, how are we going to speak to these folks in French if we're only English speaking? What site should we go to? What's the best use of our time? If all those questions you'd like to just kind of table and go on a curated gastronomic feast into Normandy that is equally full of sightseeing, cider, pore, and calvados, then do come along with me on the Tony Cider Tour in Normandy, France, heading out the last week of September. You could sign up today at the Tony Cider page found at ciderchat.com. Two episodes ago, I had Susanna Forbes and James Forbes on the podcast. That was episode 181, and it was called The Cider Insider, 100 Craft Ciders to Drink Now. Now, that's a new book that was written by Susanna, and it just came out in the U.S., so it's available in the U.S. now as of May. And part of that chat and conversation with Susanna to kind of get folks jazzed up about another cider book was to hold a little Twitter giveaway. And all you had to do was just retweet anytime you saw one of our tweets that went out into the world during a whole week of tweeting that said the Cider Insider. And folks did. People got involved. There was a lot of love out there. It was really nice to see conversations on Twitter. Uh, In case you don't know, Susanna's handle on Twitter, she has two. One at Little Pomona. That's the cidery that she and James run and own. And then she's also known as at Drink Britain. And of course, my Twitter feed is at Cider Chat. So we were dueling away, doing daily tweets out into the world. And lo and behold, each name was then put into a a hat, if you will, and randomly selected. And Susanna, who was busy last weekend, I think she was at the Royal Bath and West show in the UK. They had their big cider competition there. She sent me the winner on Saturday, and I'm so pleased to announce. Drum roll, please. Iron Bark Cider Works based in Claremont, California, won the copy of Susanna Forbes' new book, The Cider Insider, 100 Craft Ciders to Drink Now. I, I'm, I'm so happy because I had no, no you know, decision in who was going to win. But this cidery just so happens to be one that we had here on the podcast on episode 142. So you'll see a link in the show notes to that conversation with Kat, who runs that cidery. I got to hang out with her and her husband, Jim, and meet all the folks there at Claremont. I just love this place. I love what they're doing there. Really working it out in the desert country of California. So it's if you fly into LA, it's to the east of LA. That's where Ironbark Cider Works is. And now you know on their bookshelf there, they're going to have a copy of Susanna Forbes' book. It's going to be signed. And uh, it went to a great home. So Think about that. Next time you hear 
a little Twitter giveaway or some kind of contest happening, get involved because you never know. You might be that lucky winner. This is Rhea Windcaller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. Thank you.